the, the new members are going to give a, a short uh, presentation on some issues they've taken uh, in advance of today, and then we'll open up to the floor for general discussion. So, right okay. Um, so, the informed by Eddie that I'm supposed to be the soccer pundit here and survey the match, the results of the match. Um, however, what I'm trying to do here, um, I live in the Netherlands, I've been living there for 20 years, so and there's a very, very active debate about fiscal sustainability going on there. I'm very deeply involved in it, in my own head at least, and, um, and also at work. So I thought I'd just frame it in terms of the sort of debate that's going on there, because it's clearly all very relevant to Ireland. Um, and I also want to shift, even though I'm a member of the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, I want to shift the emphasis a little bit from government and fiscal balance to the individual or the household and how we can try and ensure household welfare. Because really at the end of the day we're trying to maximise the welfare of all the individuals, citizens, residents, workers, whatever, in, in the country over a long period of time. Um, if we're, winter is coming in Ireland, then it's pretty much autumn already in Holland, and they're surveying harvest, let's say. And the first thing I want to show, and I've only got three slides, so I'm not going to talk very, very, very much about it, but um, the first point I want to make, and I think it's a crucial point, is the long shadow that fiscal policy decisions of the past cast over the situation we're in now. The initial starting conditions, if you like when we're trying to look about fiscal sustainability. Looking out across the sort of 50 year horizon we've heard about today, when we're looking at really quite alarming graphs about health expenditure, debt to GDP ratios, how on earth is this all going to be absorbed? Um, I want to tell you just a quick story about what they did in the Netherlands, and it started in the early mid 80s. This is a picture of the Dutch household balance sheet. And the green one is net wealth. So, the, like, this is a percentage of GDP. They're, they're, they're doing okay in terms of their wealth, in terms of their assets. <clears throat> the uh, orange one on the left is housing wealth. And that's a really important one I want to talk about because this is where policy interacted with household behaviour really strongly in the Netherlands. They introduced mortgage tax relief up to a 30 year period at the marginal tax rate, and the marginal tax rate is 52% at the moment, and that meant that there was a huge increase in um, household borrowing, and that meant there was a huge increase, effectively, in house prices. So there was a transfer from the government to the home owning sector, and that's had a long legacy in terms of um, the effect it's had on the housing market. The second aspect of Dutch policy, I'm not, I'm not necessarily criticising it as somebody who gets a fact checking post every month from the, the tax office because I bought a house. Um, the second aspect is on pensions, and the Dutch have a very large compulsory pension scheme, which is tax deductible again at the margin. They have recently started to try and reform it, and that's the, uh, the blue asset. So they've got something over 200% of GDP in, in pension assets. The, uh, the debate about pensions in the Netherlands is, is quite novel in some ways compared to many other countries where you have a pay as you go scheme. Um, but the, the upshot of this right now, given the, the 10 years after the financial crisis of very low interest rates and very low real interest rates, is that households in the Netherlands are very illiquid and facing into a fiscal sustainability problem trying to figure out how to tackle the ageing or the, the greying of the population when you have a working population, the ones who carry this, who are very illiquid, or are in a very illiquid position because they can't cash in their pensions and they're, they're maxed out on their mortgages, poses significant problems. Okay, um, the second slide is, I, I robbed it from the internet, I hope it doesn't, uh, Violate copyright, but it's a very familiar graph. <laughs> it's the idea of the life cycle. I, thought, I want to look at this from the point of view of the individual or the household, if you like. And there's three phases effectively in terms of the life cycle during consumption. The idea is that we try to smooth our consumption across the lifetime through borrowing, this savings um, in the periods when we don't have any direct income, and saving in the periods when we do have income. So that's split into three periods A, B, and C. Um, a is the early life when you're not actually earning when you're a child. B is your working life um, up to the very good <laughs> retirement age, as we have now heard. 
and sees the post-retirement life. And I want to just focus on, in the early life, um, policy interventions, the government, the, 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 the fiscal connections with childhood and basic child benefit, child, child care subsidies, free education, free healthcare in the Netherlands. I, I'm not sure whether that's true here. Um, the current discussion here in terms of how we approach fiscal sustainability is effectively at the moment in the university sector. They're raising fees, the students are moving to a loan situation rather than a grant situation. Um, so students are moving into phase B with debt. They're moving into the period when they have to buy a house, fund their retirement and fund basically phase A for their children and they have an initial level of debt moving in there. Um, phase B is familiar, it's, uh, you have the mortgage tax relief which I mentioned, compulsory health insurance, there's risk equalisation, same as here, um, and compulsory pension contributions. And then phase C, I guess that's the one we've talked about the most here in most of the presentations, is phase C, the post-retirement life where life expectancy is extending and the, the healthcare in particular implications of that are very serious for fiscal sustainability. Okay. What's the, 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 the policy debate? Okay. Um, it's very familiar. Everybody's talked about this already. Increase the retirement age. That's a very contested, it's, it's already gone up to 67, but it's very contested for particular sectors. There's, you know, there, there are, are discussions at a, at a micro level but you can't take a a cop from the beat and go to behind a, a, a computer to run the, the salaries when it's 60. You need active life, lifelong learning if you're going to try and ma manage an increase in the retirement age to 70 and beyond and make sure that these people are actually productive. Um, active management pension funds. At the moment in the Netherlands, that's probably the most bitterly contested debate and the issue is really all about the interest rate on which pension funds measure their liabilities and their assets, the discount rate that they use, because the minute pension fund goes below um, 140% of funding ratio, benefits are cut, contributions are increased, and then that again has an effect on the, the B block, if you like, in the life cycle. And labour market reforms, but again, active labour market policy, what, what Professor Pratt mentioned. Um, now, the debate, and this is not as an IPEC speaker, this is as a I don't know, mother and daughter. <laughs> I have parents in you know, uh, nursing homes and I have children looking at the, surveying the fiscal sustainability landscape that's facing them over the next 50 years. <clears throat> um, and then the big issues are climate change, carbon tax, what kind of effect is this going to have? The sort of agreements we are now making, how are these going to be implemented? How are these going to be costed? And who's going to pay? Um, and then a big issue is the issue around intergenerational equity and also I think, and this, I don't know if it's controversial, but I think also gender equity to a certain extent um, because we're now moving into a retirement age, a, a, a cohort of women who worked all their lives, but the gender pay gap is still there. I, I, I fully understand why, I know the studies, I don't think it's a discriminatory gap, but it is there. So it does mean that we're going to have, in 20 or 30 years time, women with a lower income than men, structurally. And it seems to me that all of these structural things that are building up are interesting, important, and need to be discussed now. Health, I'm not even going to go there. I think Maybank gave a fantastic um, presentation about the, the, <laughs> the difficulties and the complexities of the Irish health sector, and I, I don't have anything to add to that. But clearly, that's the, the core the core health, the core um, what's the word for? expense facing us, if you like, if, if, if nothing is done. But we saw that from the OER uh, presentation. Um, looking at uh, a a government, the size of a government sector moving from 36 to 46 percent. I, I can't see that happening. I can't see that being sustainable. Is that sustainable? Is that something that we collectively in society would like? 
no, but it seems to me it's a debate that needs to, to start with. from the Irish Government Economic Evaluation Service. Excuse me, ma'am. Um, okay, so I only have a few minutes, so um, I'm going to start with this slide, so I'm going to come from the expenditure side. Um, this slide just shows you the total government expenditure for this year. Um, the total purse is 76 billion, of which about 10 billion is um, uh, allocated to e EU payments and debt servicing, and then the rest goes uh, into providing public services and uh, public spending. Uh, the biggest spenders there are social protection, health, education. Um, demands for increases in uh, public expenditure are coming from numerous sides. You can see this just kind of tries to capture how, how crowded that space is um, and all of these uh, voices I suppose have very valid reasons um, but we know that we have a budget constraint and how do we then make sure that we're using money the best we can. Um, Population projections, we've heard a lot about demographics and you know the impact. We all know, regardless of what we think about fertility rates are going to look like or migration flows are going to look like, all lines are going up. Obviously, we can debate about the ranges and assumptions and so on, but there's no question that demographics are putting pressure um, and they are going to put significant pressure on the public uh, expenditure. How do we include it uh, when we plan uh, public expenditure? We do look at um, demographics, we look at CSO projections, we, we pick a scenario that we um, think uh, is the good one to, to use. Uh, we then try to use those projections to estimate what the spending is likely to look like um, over the same short, medium term uh, periods. We look at health, obviously, social protection, education as the biggest spenders, and within those different streams, um, as well as uh, children uh, services uh, too. Now these are then included into our three year budgetary ceilings, but demographics don't play the only, uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, role in setting those ceilings or other things uh, that we take on board. But what I want to focus on is because we're talking about demographics and the pressures and so on, uh, and of course nobody's debating that more people uh, and the older people within uh, the, the, the overall population that has pressures, that, that place pressures on the public expenditure. And um, what I'm going to, I suppose, um, uh, talk about is, is maybe looking at other things that we need to bear in mind when we're, we're, when we're thinking about what the demand and expenditure um, is so it's not just about age it's about other attributes of the the, the composition of the population that uh, that will that will demand that will uh, uh, create the, the the final sort of demand on uh, on the services and then nobody's talking about maybe downward pressures of demographics in certain areas um, and and whether we ever um, actually reduce expenditure because there is maybe um, at less than graphic pressure in a particular spending area. So, um, I start here with uh, something that I've stolen from uh, Otto van Bismarck, who said that laws are like sausages and it's better not seeing them being made. And I just wonder, you know, we, we certainly don't want policies to be like sausages, and IG uh, is, is, is trying to really um, make sure that through our analytical work, we are constantly questioning our policies and asking, are we doing the right thing for each spending stream that we have in the public purse? And are we doing it right? Because obviously every euro spent on poorly designed public services is a euro less to spend on all of those uh, uh, important um, policy areas that I had on that world, uh, world cloud slide. So I am going to talk about health just a little bit more, just to add, I suppose, um, another maybe perspective on the complexity. And, you know, we were talking about demographics and then Jim was talking about costs as well. Um, so 
of course, you know, the demographics when, you, when, you think, when we think about health are, are, are very important and uh, the, the, the more people we have and the older they are, um, that's going to put significant pressure on demand for healthcare services. But there are other things as well that, um, that impact on healthcare expenditure and they were also uh, mentioned here by, by a number of speakers. And, you know, there's obviously where we are in the business cycle uh, but importantly, what are our structures and incentives that we have set up in the system? Um, and then, of course, the technology, and, and James spoke about that as well. So, this was already said, health is a very labour-intensive sector. We seem to be paying for provision rather than performance, which again, you know, raises a question about the implications for the spending. And then we know that acute care is more expensive than primary, and we're trying to kind of rebalance those and the question is, how, how are we doing in relation to all of these? And I suppose my argument is that, you know, before we start thinking about the demographic pressures and expenditure, which are sort of looking at that incremental increase, I think we need to reflect very, very strongly on what we're doing now and to try to see how the dynamics are of different drivers and whether we can actually make savings and do things better before we start thinking about just the headcount and the aging and, and, and the cost of, of, of drugs that are coming on stream. And in that context, IDIS has done a lot of work trying to get under the bonnet of what the drivers actually are. And uh, we all know that we have been running serious overspendings in the area of healthcare. And um, we can see that uh, being a labour intensive sector as well, it's not surprising that a lot of it is going on staff. But when you think about that in the, in the three year period since the moratorium was lifted in 2014, HSC recruited additional 14,000 people into the service. Um, that just alone uh, is, is a pretty striking figure. Importantly then, when we look at that, you can say, well, there was a pent up demand and so on. We had a significant cost constantly running on the agency staff that was trying to deal with that issue of moratorium and the demand that was there probably, you know, significantly coming from the de demographic sources. But now that we've in in that we're significantly increasing the number of, of, of people working in the uh, employed by the HSC, we don't see uh, uh, decre decreases in the um, agency staff and I think uh, maybe Anne's uh, chart showed that as well. So that then, when you look at the more expensive sort of provision set, the set up in the acute sector, uh, it's kind of, when you look at the uh, whole time equivalence uh, per se day case, they're increasing. So we're not seeing, we don't seem to be getting actually much efficiency out of, out of the, 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 the staff that is actually increasing in the, in the sector. When we look at primary care then, uh, we're trying obviously to rebalance and have more now emphasis on the primary care which should deliver us maybe better value for money and, and, and potentially better care as well um, for, for people. And we look at say medical cards and GP visitation cards. Um, demographics of course play, play an important role but then when we looked at this we could see that um, as the economic, um, uh, economic recovery sort of started, the labour market improvement also meant that certain cohorts actually um, did not qualify anymore for medical cards um, and that there was a downward pressure coming from that uh, business cycle side even though the ageing population um, um, actually meant that there was maybe more cost coming from, from the demographic side. But, you know, there were two forces going in different directions. On top of that, while the older cohort, of course, uh, has, a, has, a, has a greater sort of cost associated in terms of drugs, um, we also, when we, when we analyze the drug side, we could see that the cost of drugs is actually going down. And not the least because, you know, there was uh, analytical work done by IGs that was kind of questioning why Ireland was paying so much and then the new deal with the pharmaceutical industry was struck some years ago that is now yielding some savings there for us. Now that of course is then offset with the high tech drugs and the expenses that are coming there and the choices that we have to make around what we, what we fund in terms of high, high tech drugs. So basically what I'm illustrating here is that, the, that yes demographics play a part 
but there are other things as well that might be cancelling that as well and other things actually emerging and it's about netting out where does this actually stand and then again in terms of more efficiency and kind of trying to, to look at say um, care for the elderly and the home care packages and the home, uh, home health services that we have, you know, when we analyze this, we could see that while these two types of services are, are sort of uh, trying to aim, um, have similar objectives, they, they have very different costs and they seem to be practiced in different magnitudes around Ireland. So depending on what region you look at, some regions prefer home care packages and some home health. They have different cost tag attached to them and there's no obvious reason that there is an underlying difference in the population with their survey. So basically uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, yes demographics are important, yes we're incorporating demographics and trying to estimate um, uh, future public spending, but there is a serious complexity and there's still serious issues that we need to sort of understand to be able to drive uh, greater efficiencies and savings before we start thinking about increases in expenditure. And IGS is busy working, not just in health, but in all other policy areas, to try to get under the bonnet of what the drivers actually are and to ensure for all of us uh, better value for money <coughs> and better services to the taxpayer. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jasmina. Uh, our final contributor is uh, John McCarthy, the Chief Economist of the Department of Finance. Uh, labour productivity. 
Um, and from the beginning of the next decade, the potential growth rate is set to slow. It's probably a little bit backloaded uh, given, uh, given the labor supply and so forth. But you can see all components uh, tend, to, tend to ease off. Uh, in terms of labor supply, uh, the contribution will, will almost half. Uh, an even sharper fall in, uh, in capital deepening. Um, and while, while still relatively strong, the contribution from TFP growth uh, will, will, uh, will still be reasonably strong. Um, although that in itself doesn't um, generate too much optimism. Um, as you know, TFP is, as Robert Solo once said, it's, it's a measure of our ignorance. So Ireland in common with a lot of, of advanced countries, where TFP is the main driver of growth, we're sort of pinning our hopes on something that, uh, that we know very, very little about. Um, so what we've done to try and socialize the problem within the, the political system and elsewhere uh, is to simply ask the question, what if there was no policy response other than what's already been implemented uh, and uh, the, the, the primary balance and, and uh, the growth rate was, was assumed to evolve as we have suggested. This is a purely hypothetical scenario, I, I would stress. Um, but you can see that from about the end of the next decade, uh, the debt ratio, and this is uh, debt to GNI star, which we think is the, is the more appropriate measure, it begins to increase gradually, and then there's a very substantial increase from about 2040 onwards. Okay? And the reason for that is, uh, is the, the increase in spending as well as the lower growth in revenue associated with the lower potential growth rate of the economy. So there's a, we start running a, a primary deficit, uh, a, a deficit, a primary deficit that's below the, the debt stabilizing primary deficit. Not exactly all minus G here, but, uh, but a reasonable proxy. Um, and again, many people here will be aware of uh, the renewed focus on, uh, on so-called all minus G, uh, given Olivier Blanchard's uh, presidential address to the American Economic Association uh, earlier this year. Um, and he focused on, I think, uh, if you read the paper, he focused on uh, or uh, being less than G in the likes of, of the US, uh, lots of European countries and so forth. But the Irish experience is, is, not, as, uh, is not as promising. Um, I think if you look at it over, a bit, uh, over about 40 years, uh, I think or has been greater than G on, uh, on about a third of, of, of occasions. So, um, anyway, there's, a, there's about a 50 percentage point increase in, in the debt ratio on the basis of, uh, of no policy change. So, in the, in the paper then uh, that we published in August, uh, we outlined, and this is similar actually to, uh, to what Hervé has, has suggested, uh, that a holistic approach is needed to address this. We need to address both numerator and denominator. Um, on the numerator, the expenditure side uh, of the equation needs to be uh, adjusted. Um, we've done some simulations whereby uh, uh, if you were to align uh, retirement age with life expectancy, you could take zero percentage points. 0.7% of GNI of the, uh, the primary deficit each year. Um, I think there is a justification for this as well, given that we have different occupational now, uh, occupational types, there's, there's less coal mining, so to speak, and, and more <coughs> office work. Uh, so, so the physical demands aren't as strong. Uh, the report also highlighted the need to, uh, to restrain non-age related uh, expenditure. Uh, and we also made reference to the fact that initial conditions matter. So what I'm talking about here is, is the high level of, of public indebtedness uh, at the moment and the need to ensure that uh, all windfall gains uh, are used for, for debt reduction. But also there's a need to, to address the, uh, the denominator, that is uh, nominal output growth to, to boost the supply side of the economy. Um, and the sort of the key uh, targets there would be, again, as mentioned by OECD colleagues, uh, to address uh, the participation rate of, of, uh, of older workers, as well as addressing barriers to, to female participation, um, but also to boost.
boost productivity uh, through investment in, uh, in human capital, physical capital, and TFP. So with that, by way of introductory comments, uh, Seamus, I'll leave it there. Thank you.